Welcome, champion entrepreneurs. We are live from the Go CEO Studios, where we talk to CEOs and founders and visionaries about their businesses, and more importantly, the characteristics and personal strategies of the man or the woman behind the business, so we can better understand what led to huge success. And uh, I am Corey Bergeron, your host. I'm a former national TV spokesperson for over 350 brands. I'm an author, a speaker, a business consultant, and CEO. And today's topic is how to build amazing business credit for your EIN without using your own credit and social security number. Most of us understand uh, like the basics of personal credit, but business credit has always seemed to be this voodoo that follows different rules and it's tough to understand and a lot of us do it wrong. Well, today we're gonna be speaking with Ty Crandall, the CEO of Credit Suite and hands down uh, one of the most uh, foremost authorities on business credit and the reality of how it actually works. If you're watching this video on YouTube, uh, make sure you click subscribe and uh, the little bell just below this video screen so we can let you know when new videos are released. Now, listen, before we get started with today's interview with Ty, I wanna welcome the founder of our sponsor, Board of Advisors, the world's greatest mastermind, Mr. Mike Calhoun. And Mike joins us each week to provide his top Three, these are three specific strategies or insights you should know to enhance your business or life. Mike, welcome. What do you have for us today? Yeah, this is uh, something that I've been working with several of the individuals like Brian Salee and I just had a great call yesterday, Kevin Marshall. We've had some good strategy calls over uh, the last couple of weeks. And then as we're doing these calls with Corey, they're filtering over into strategy and uh, kind of what I like to call Brian and actually Salee and I came up with this concept of the North Star, right? So what is your North Star? And you can do it in general uh, for 2022, for the next quarter. But what is your North Star in terms of a couple aspects, right? So if we if we go back to the book, which we uh, sponsored and we gave out at one or uh, two meetings, uh, the one thing, right? The power of simplification and focus, as my good friend Jason Medley says, focus will make you wealthy. If we think about the North Star, and we, uh, there we go. Um, if we think about the North Star, and we have the uh, understanding of what is our primary goal? What is our primary problem? And what is our primary relationship like cut everything else out. What is the, the, the thing that we want to accomplish most? And we'll just say for 2022 or this upcoming quarter, what does that look like in detail, clearly, right? Like really put a description in, in color. If it were a coloring book page, make, bring that thing to life, the absolute best that you can, right? The big primary goal and the big primary problem and the absolute number one relationship that you want to procure or you want to enrich over this next, let's just call it 90 days, right? Uh, until Q1 or Q2. And what I would say is the, the articulation of that from a leadership role will help you focus. If you look at Elon Musk, I mean, I think it's I think he's brilliant, but I also think it's weird that he makes every decision focus around how soon it's going to put people on Mars in a colony or something, right? Like everything he does is about putting people on Mars. Well, in your business, what is it that everything is truly focused around, right? Like Ty, in your business with credit, what is that number one goal that you've got? And you're very data-driven. You're very specific. I've known you a long time. What is that number one goal that you're focused on, right? And have you colored it in so that everybody around you and on your team can answer that question if you ask them, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're on, is, we're, we're on a mission right. to help a half a million by 2030. That's our main goal. And then our whole company rallies around that goal weekly, as a matter of fact, not to... Yeah. And, and, and if you're so specific with the goal and you're so specific with the problem in a, in a community like Board of Advisors, if everybody knows that, hey, this is the problem I want to solve, right? Like, that's it. I want to solve that one problem. 
everyone will rally around you to help you solve that problem. And right now for me, if, if I was just being transparent, I have so many inbound communications. I'm really trying to create this kind of coin, if you want to call them like, like a coin sorter mechanism that gets everybody what they need as fast as I can get it to them at the highest quality response possible, even if it isn't necessarily me. And is there a way to do it better than I can even do it based on potentially data, right? So me solving that over the next quarter is going to do something that really is meaningful to the members where I can provide them more value and more personal conversation and time, right? So, uh, and the other thing too, is that one relationship, obviously it should be your spouse. I mean, that's kind of where it all starts, that significant other. But what is that one relationship over this next quarter that quite frankly, if you just leaned into it, if you just contributed invested time and attention and conversation that really outweighs every other relationship Maybe it's for your business. Maybe it's for your life. Maybe it's it, it has it's a multi pronged kind of approach where like this one person. As a matter of fact, and I'll even share with you like Ed Coble has been a great friend of mine uh, out of Tampa here, and you know he's always checking on me. You, know, you got a guy running a four or five billion dollar firm, but and he's always checking on me. Why am I not checking on him? as often as he's checking on me, right? He's the one inviting me to lunch. Why am I not inviting him to lunch? Where could the leverage from a relationship like that go if I leaned, made an intent, intentional effort to lean into it further, right? So I think for everybody on the call and everybody on uh, Facebook, get really focused. What is that one thing you're shooting for? What is that one problem you're really going to solve? And let everybody know you want help with it. And, and they will help you. People like helping people, believe it or not. And then, uh, you know, what is that one relationship that quite frankly is sitting right there under your nose, many times knocking on your door that we might take for granted that we need to lean into it and make that little investment of reciprocation? Yeah, I, I love that, Mike. And it's a really good point. You know, I think back to uh, like Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was asked, why does Apple exist? And his response was, we exist to orchestrate a transition of power from the few to the many. Oh, by the way, we also make really sexy computers and phones, right? It wasn't about the computers and the phones. It was the computers and the phones being a vehicle, a mechanism that created that transition of power from the few to the many. That was his goal. And that was his North Star. What do you, you're showing me a piece of paper. No, I'm what are you showing, showing me? Ty, that Ty, I usually have at least one full page of notes to share with everybody after this Go CEO interview. Darren, last week, I had two full pages. It was it was beast mode. So, uh, you know, can we This make is a competition. It? We're going for three can, pages. Can we make it three full pages? Come on now. I know how All competitive right. Ty is. All right, buddy. So, hold my beer. <laughs> Mike, uh, I appreciate you coming to us with your insight and advice. Uh, listen, uh, we do crowdsource ideas for Mike's top three every single week from the viewership. So uh, if you're listening to Mike right now and there's a topic you'd love to hear him talk about, just drop it in chat. If you're on our Zoom call with us, if you're one of our privileged few that actually get to uh, view this live uh, in Zoom, then please drop that into chat and we'll consider that for a topic for next week for Mike. All right. Hey, Corey. So, yes, sir. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leak a little bit of information here. So, and I think uh, right. Analog has not pushed it out to the group yet, but going forward every week, we're going to do what's called an open mic as well. So this mm. is just a call where I'm complete. It, 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 we schedule it. I think it's on Wednesdays at five to kind of make it yep. friendly for everybody. Uh, it's just, it's just, I mean, it might go for an hour. It might go for two hours. I don't care if it goes for three hours, but it's Wednesday evening open mic. And uh, it's going to be a little more of a compression zone of the fact of we've got a lot of questions, coming, just random questions kind of coming in all week to where I think answering them in a collective format may create a better response for everybody, more clarity, more collaboration. 
And uh, it gives me an intimate checkpoint. I don't care if, if, if Ty Crandall or Kevin Marshall or Brian Slee are the only guys that show up, then I just want to be there, my door open to have that conversation, contribute to them, you know, just making sure there is a weekly checkpoint for the members that uh, doesn't necessarily have to you know, have a required scheduled call, right? So yep. uh, we're calling it, what do we call it, Corey? Open mic? Open mic every single Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And if for Dude. some reason uh, you're listening to that and you're thinking, you know, you're on Facebook right now and you're like, what does that have to do with me? Just to let you know, Mike is the CEO of our sponsor, Board of Advisors, the world's greatest mastermind. And what he's doing is mentioning a Zoom call uh, that he's doing every single Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Board of Advisors membership who happens to be consuming this right now live on Zoom. So that's, uh, that's the announcement that he's talking about. And uh, Mike will reiterate that at the end just to make sure that everybody knows about that because it is of huge value to the membership to know that they can have uh, you have your finger on the pulse of what's going on uh, within the membership every single week. So that's that's a really awesome value. And I'm glad you're doing it. I'm excited for the launch of Open Mic. OK, this week we have Mr. Ty Crandall now. Ty and I, I mean, we've tried to hook up time and time and time again. His calendar is just so slammed all the time. It's like impossible to get even like 15, 20 minutes with this guy. But we managed to get him on the call this week. Ty is an international speaker. He is a business credit expert. He's featured on TV shows and podcasts across the country. He's been doing this for decades. He's the author of two best-selling books on business credit, Perfect Credit and Business Credit Decoded. He is also the CEO of Credit Suite, where he consults with thousands and thousands of clients on credit building and scoring. He is widely recognized as one of the most credible business credit coaching operations in the country. Ty, I am honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Corey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You got it, man. Okay, so listen, let's just kind of set the stage here for everybody that's unfamiliar with Credit Suite. You are the CEO of that company. Please describe to us, who do you typically work with at Credit Suite? And, uh, you know, just kind of take me through what that looks like for most of your clients. Sure, absolutely. So we help entrepreneurs and there's three main things that we do. We help business owners improve their fundability. We fix the stuff that really gets them denied for financing and credit so they can turn around and get approvals. We also come in and we help build business credit for their EIN that's not linked to them personally. So separating that personal and business liability, giving the business an asset where it could fund itself and helping the business owners be able to get the most money at the best terms. And then we work with over a thousand funding sources and really every legitimate type of funding product out there. So we could match clients with the best funding products that work for them and oftentimes get one, two, three, uh, or a multitude of different kinds of credit line and loans approved to be able to get the money they need to start and grow their business. So you're just like, a, you're like one-stop shopping. You know, somebody comes to you as a business owner and they're like, look, I don't even know where to start with my business credit. I need the strategy to get me where I need to go. And then once I get there, I need the funding so that I can actually use that business credit to build my business outside of me personally, putting it on credit cards or getting personally secured loans. Like just let, let's put everything into the business. Let the EIN carry the weight instead yeah. of me personally. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, you are... I've heard you speak like over and over and over again. And each time, like my brain just wants to explode. I mean, there's so much knowledge up there and so much value you have to bring each time. Tell me how you got that smart at business credit. What does your professional journey look like over the past like 17 or 20 years that you've been doing this? Take me through it. Well, I spent decades in the financial services and the first company I ever owned was a mortgage company. So I put a lot of blood, sweat, tears, late nights into building that, making it successful. Uh, then the mortgage crisis occurred and literally overnight, I lost the ability to close loans, which was our, our, our primary function. So held on as long as I could, the business ultimately failed and I make the exact same mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make, personally guaranteed everything in the business name. So what happened then was that business failure carried over and was catastrophic to me on the personal financial 
financial side. So my business debt showed up on my personal credit report, ruining my personal credit. And I always anticipated for a crisis, I had tons of money in the bank and I had lots of available credit. Well, that immediately reduced all my credit limits. My credit issuers lowered my limits to what I owed because they saw other stuff appearing on there that was negative. Then that made it even worse and removed all my available credit. At the exact same time, the business debtors that we owed uh, got the ability to come after my personal assets. So every liquid asset I had, they took, they even came in and cleaned out my bank account, um, resulting in you know negative thousands of dollars because I had checks written against all that money was in the account. So I remember, Corey, the low, one of the lowest times of my life, I was literally trying to pass bad checks just to get the electric turned on in my home. So my then pregnant wife didn't come home to the, as you know, grueling Florida heat um, in the middle of summer. So wow. you know, what happened at that point, it was really a shift in my life. And it might sound very cliche, but I really had always been in business to make money at that point. And at that at that moment, I just experienced pain and kind of shifted where I was no longer in it to make money. It was more about helping people not experience that pain that I went through. So I started helping business owners. I started helping consumers fix their consumer credit. I needed help during the mortgage crisis. I knew a lot of others did. And along the way, a lot of people started to ask me about business credit and I did what we all do when we're asked something we don't know. I stalled while I Googled the answer. Uh, but uh, <laughs> fortunately, there was nothing about Google. It was kind of astonishing. There really were companies offering it. There were people talking about it. Uh, you had to go you know, into the bowels of Google, Corey, which is like page two or three. It was horrendous back there. Never get that deep down into Google to even figure out the basics of business credit. When I realized what it was and realized that you could separate consumer and commercial credit and business debts stay business debts and business debtors can't come after cons- you know, you know, your personal assets, then I realized it just it would have completely saved me if I just would have known about it. Here I am with a decade plus of financial experience. I don't know about it. I know lay people don't know about it. All my knowledge and experience means I don't know anything about it. So then I just dove in. I, I realized that the way I was brought up is you never complain about a problem unless you're willing to propose a solution. So I decided to figure it out. And I started really learning in real time what business credit was, what Dun & Bradstreet was. I Googled, researched everything I could. Then I would put it into a presentation and I would pitch, you know, present it to the world. Uh, and then in a very short period of time, I started realizing I had thousands of people that were watching what was going on. And there was massive interest in this topic like I had. Um, and then that started a journey of creating a product, creating a solution, helping people with business credit. But unfortunately, that sent me down a rabbit hole. Because what happened at that point is I started to realize all of these other things we just don't understand. Lenders that are pulling credit reports that we don't even know exist. Places like LexisNexis where the house, every email address we've ever had, every address we've ever lived at, every phone number, every license we've ever had issued, revoked, every speeding ticket, every kind of uh, any kind of, of mischief we've been into is on those reports, as well as every insurance policy we've had, car we've ever known, VIN number. I mean, our entire life's yeah. history. Listen, yeah. the first time I heard you describe to me what is in LexisNexis, and listen, I, I never went and looked either. You know, I was pulling from, uh, you know, all the, all the st- you know, Equifax and, and Experian and TransUnion, and I'm just looking at my stuff. I had no idea where to even go look at, you know, I know there's Dun & Bradstreet. Every time I talk to them, they want to milk me for some kind of money and sign up for some kind of program in order to get verified or whatever the heck it is. And then you're talking about LexisNexis and that right away, I thought, now, wait a minute, Dun & Bradstreet is, isn't it? Like there's, there's more when they want to look at business credit. And you were telling me, that like if your personal credit report is like 20 pages long, LexisNexis is like 200 pages long, right? <laughs> Something that yeah, I thought, mine, mine's 300 pages. I don't even then. think I know that much information about me. Like, it's that's... kind of a crazy thing. I mean, when the first time I ever saw my LexisNexis report it, and it specifically, it's the most intrusive thing I've ever seen in my life. It really is the most intrusive thing because everything about your entire life's history from marriage records to divorce records, to information about your kids, to, it's all in this report. And we get these consumer reports. We think judgments and bankruptcies and stuff fall off in time. But on these reports, they live indefinitely. So here we are trying to work on TransUnion, Equifax, and you know, Experian consumer reports. And we don't even know this whole world behind the scenes where banks already have all this stuff, all the stuff that we think is dropped off and we got removed and, and that we think we're in good shape, they know about it. They have check systems, which looks at our banking history. They have small business financial exchange, which most people know nothing about, which means all these banks openly share information with each other. When you fill out an application for a Wells Fargo credit card, that information goes to Bank of America. Most people have no idea that this kind of sharing is happening behind the scenes with all of our data. So just 
It's been an interesting ride, Corey. It just sent me down this rabbit hole of realizing that there's all these reasons business owners get denied that's not what they think it is. There's this whole fundability formula lenders, credit issuers use that we don't even realize is being used to, to get us denied. There's all this data that's being collected about us and shared behind the scenes at all kinds of decisions about insurance and loans and credit issuers and suppliers. They're all making all these informed decisions with data that we don't even know about. So it's like it's like an unfair game when it comes to getting capital. And that's really where I am today is just pulling back the curtains, revealing this, and then giving actionable info for entrepreneurs to get this stuff, understand what it is, correct it, fix it, and then create the perception that lenders and credit insurers want them to have so they have a greater ability to get money. Yeah. And listen, like most entrepreneurs, when I started a business, I started it with like a personal credit card. I went in and said, okay, you know, I, I need some, I need some capital, right? I got to get the ball moving here. I got to get a little bit of marketing going. I've got to get some like business assets. I've got to get some stuff. I need a printer, you know, like I'm, I'm just going to put it all on my business, on my personal credit card and I'll just write it off on my LLC at the end of the year. And, and that's it. And then I try and make a transition from there to getting maybe a small business loan to get things going. And, you know, when I needed to end immediately, it's based on my personal credit. So I, I didn't see a way around it. You know, I just had to do it that way. And it wasn't until I was really, really far down the road, you know, five or six or seven years in business that finally people started looking at my EIN and saying, oh, okay, well, you know, you've got like a Home Depot account and you got this account and that account. Okay, well, you've built up enough on your EIN that, that we can go ahead and look at that and put it in the name of your EIN, but we're still going to ask you to be a personal guarantor, you know, and I'm sitting there going, is this ever going to get separated from me personally? Is it ever, I, it just seems like the holy grail. It can't ever happen. And what you're telling me is it can. So let's start from the beginning here and just ask you, you know, who can qualify for business credit on their EIN alone? Well, to touch upon that, and I, I'll jump in, but to expand on what you say, you make the same mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make is that we start a yeah. business, we start with the most available funds, which is our consumer credit cards. The problem is, is that the system wasn't designed for that to happen, meaning that consumer credit cards were never designed to fund businesses. Business, businesses eat up a lot more money than we do as consumers. So a lot of people that follow those mistakes, they come in, they use consumer credit cards, as you know, takes a lot longer and a lot more money to launch a business or to do anything in business than we anticipate. I mean, I run my business where whatever we reasonably think it will take time frame, we double, right? Whatever we reasonably think the cost is, we double. We just learned that in doing business. A lot of startups don't know that. So they quickly max out those credit cards. It ruins their consumer credit scores because 30%, a third, Corey, of your consumer credit scores, just what percentage of that you're using. So you eat that up quickly funding a business. Then your ability to use the credit to fund the business, your, your, your consumer credit to get loans and stuff is inhibited. So it's like, you know, you come right out the gate, you get behind the eight ball, then you can't use the consumer credit the way it's designed to. What a lot of entrepreneurs don't know, and you know, Entrepreneur Magazine has it like 90% of business owners don't know this, is that there's a whole different type of credit. There's business credit, there's commercial credit, which was created for this specific purpose. It's designed for a business to fund itself. It's designed for a business, just like you did as a consumer, to pay business bills as agreed and then get a report and then get a score and then get more accounts that report. And the deeper this profile gets, the more the bureaus recommend we should be lent it. The more types of credit become available, the more types of financing. And eventually we get to a place like Dell, right? I mean, we, we know this is possible because we don't think Michael Dell is signing a guarantor for $100 million Dell credit lines. But the reality is what we don't know is that Dell doesn't get $100 million credit lines because they're Dell. They get $100 million credit lines because if you look at their credit report, they have hundreds of trade lines. They've proven hundreds of times that they pay back their bills as agreed. And they started small and they got bigger credit cards and bigger loans and it got bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, and this is what's interesting into in, your question. Anybody can do this. I, anybody that owns a business can follow the exact same steps that Dell or Walmart follow to be able to do this and not to get sidetracked, but Walmart's an interesting topic. If you've ever read said Sam Walton's book, you know, Sam started Walmart this whole way. He would talk about how he would sit there while the person would go in the back of the room and pull his Dun & Bradstreet credit report. This is back in the 70s to see if they should issue him credit. You know, nowadays, 80% of what Walmart puts on their shelves, they're buy with business credit. They go buy the bounty paper towels of credit. They put them on the shelf. You buy them. You give Walmart your money. Walmart takes your money and they pay it back to bounty. 80%. I mean, more than all shareholder value combined in Walmart is through business credit. So the bigger businesses, they're all doing this. They're all wow. using and this to grow. Small businesses don't know about it. As, as a small business CEO, I, I look at 
people like Walmart. I look at people like Dell and I think, oh man, they've got to have, you know, they've got to have all their business expenses tied down just with their slush funds. Like there's, you know, they, it wouldn't occur to me that they're still running in what feels like that hamster wheel of I need business credit in order to supply, you know, my inventory in order to sell it, in order to pay off the business credit, in order to like it just it you would think that they're beyond running in that hamster wheel, but you're telling me 80% of everything on the Walmart shelves is financed that way. And that's that's a little reassuring for me. <laughs> as a business owner, I look at that and I go, oh gosh, you know, if one of the largest retailers in the world is still doing that with 80% of their inventory, it makes me feel pretty good. Sure. Well, and the interesting thing, Corey, is that they're all this way. All of the biggest companies that we know privately and publicly owned, they all do the same thing. The reason they've got as big as they are is because of OPM. They're using other people's money better than what small business owners are. And I'll give you a simple example. Uh, this, you guys, we had referenced Apple earlier, right? So if we look at Apple, the most, you know, the, the richest company on the planet, yeah, Apple has 195 billion with the B cash on hand, but yet they have 113 billion in debt. I mean, right? So to, to a Dave Ramsey follower of the world, that doesn't make any sense. You use the cash to pay the debt. But Apple wouldn't be Apple if they weren't really good at leveraging other people's money to be able to get where they are. It's why they're the, the most valuable company in the world, because they figured it out. It's the same thing as Walmart. It's the same thing as Publix in our backyard in Lakeland, one of the largest privately owned companies. So I oftentimes stand on stages and I pull the business credit reports from all of the biggest companies out there. And you can see hundreds of trade lines, hundreds of trade lines, hundreds of trade wow. lines. And this means there's hundreds and hundreds of companies that are lending them all types of money through business credit financing, and they're leveraging that to grow. And that's how they've got to be as big as they are. All right. So let's, let's take it down to brass tacks here. You know, from first steps, what does an entrepreneur need to do first before applying for business credit or some kind of financing? I find a lot of entrepreneurs get denied and think it's their credit score. They think it's their income. And the reality is, if you look at the statistics of loan denials, the vast majority, meaning the, the, the minimum, a minor part of it is your credit score wasn't good enough. Your income wasn't high enough. The vast majority of denials aren't because of that stuff. It's because of just basic credibility items that are called fundability that lenders and credit issuers look at. And they're looking at this stuff really specifically for two reasons. The first of which is credibility. They're just looking at the basics of how you've set up your business to see if you're legitimate. Are you even a real business? So for example, SBA says a sole proprietorship is for somebody that's experimenting with a concept. That's what SBA says. They don't even consider it an entity. SBA doesn't. But yeah, we have business owners out there trying to build million dollar businesses on a sole prop and they're not taken seriously by lenders and credit issuers. So it's these things like coming in and setting up the right entity, getting a corporation or even an LLC. It's, it's getting a business address that's separate from your home. It's getting a business phone number that's separate from your mobile and listing it with 411 and getting a professional website and a professional email address. It's interesting. I, I can tell you how many opportunities I don't take because somebody emails me from a Gmail address. It's like, I can't even take you seriously, nor do lenders and credit issuers in those cases. You want a merchant account and a bank account and a license. I mean, it's crazy. If you can get a license, which we can in Florida very easily, I can type in Hillsborough County business license and I can just go get one voluntarily. But that license, when I submit it to a lender or credit issuer, gives me tremendous amounts of credibility, even though it's like 60 bucks. It's like super simple to get. So we found there's over 125 of these fundability factors lenders, credit issuers look at. I talked about some of the foundational, just making sure your entire business is structured where it looks legit, it looks credible, goes a long way to getting you approved. But the second thing that lenders and credit are so now wait a minute, let me let me ask you just really quick. You said there are 120 fundability items. Now these are things that you discovered over time. Where could somebody get some visibility on those 120 items? Where could they go and say, "Oh crap, okay," and like. It, it would be like a coming to Jesus moment to take a look at 120 yeah. items and say, how many of these do have I satisfied? Where can people get visibility on that? So we've got a lot of them in our a great guide, creditsuite.com forward slash EIN. And at creditsuite.com forward slash EIN, step-by-step business credit building guide, a lot of those fundability items. Um, and if they go to youtube.com forward slash credit suite, just type in fundability or just go to YouTube and type in fundability. We've got a lot of training that breaks down all the different aspects of fundability somebody can focus on.
Awesome. Appreciate those resources. Okay. Go ahead and, uh, and, and pick it up there. I just didn't want that to go by without us addressing it. I appreciate it. And the second thing, and more important than even the first is fraud. (laughs) Like, I don't know about you, but I I get attempts at fraud all the time, right? People the the other day, I mean, $10,000 in credit card charges from Apple in one day, right? I mean, just all the stuff that we're exposed to in fraud. Think about being a bank. Banks, what happens is the ma- the majority of applications that come to them aren't even real. So here we are, a lonely business owner trying to apply for a loan. And what we don't realize is what the bank cares about first and more important is, is the application coming in even legitimate and credible. And so this is when they're taking this application data and they're comparing it to places like Secretary of State, Yellow Page listings, our social media pages, our websites. Uh, you know, the hundreds of yellow page listings and other places that were listed online, they just want to see congruency. What they're looking for is, is this person applying a real business? And what's crazy is that we oftentimes start a business. We come in, we set up the entity, right? We go to the secretary of state, we get it. Then we get our address. Then we get our phone number. Then we get our website or email. And then we never go back and update that information. Now we're applying for a loan and everything on the application doesn't, isn't even congruent with what's on places like Secretary of State. So what's happening is this is why the Small Business Financial Exchange, where they bank share information and LexisNexis, it's where all this data comes in because lenders and credit issuers are pulling all this data to just compare to make sure our business is even legit. If there's any hint, any thought that it's not, they immediately deny the application before you're even looking at income, before you're even looking at credit. So congruency is really important, making sure that when you get your fundability in line and everything's set up the right way, is it set up the right way everywhere? I mean, how many times we change an address and phone number? We don't think about going to our Facebook page for the business and changing it. All this stuff has to be updated. It all has to be congruent off online listings, offline listings, our utility statements, our bank statements. All this stuff has to be congruent. So that way lenders look at the first check, say, yep, this is a real business. Then they go, okay, is this business credible? Yeah, business address, business phone number. It's like a checklist. And then business owners meet all this. Then you get to the real heart of it, which is what it takes to get approved. And if you just do that, then statistically, it's you know 40, 50 percent, depending on the study you look at, increase in your probability of getting and that's, approval credit that's simple stuff. You Basic know, we're stuff. not talking about brain surgery here. I mean, that's just simple. It's it's one hour of invested time for an entrepreneur with a long term payoff. That's just you know, it's it snowballs. That's that's not complicated. And I expect that you know, okay, I know kind of the ins and outs of personal credit. When it comes to business credit, it feels like, okay, it's got to be exponentially more complicated. But what you're describing is not complicated stuff. So listen, if someone wanted to build business credit, if they were just like, okay, look, I I am tired of having myself involved with every single application that I put in. I'm tired of personal guarantees coming in where people are telling me that if somehow my business fails to make a payment, they're going to come take my car, right? They're going to, they're going to affect the house my kids live in. Like, you know, I, I've been in that situation. You know, I've, I've, had, I've had hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in credit lines that were used for my business in order to fund video productions and then come back around, you know, paying off contractors and everything else, and then come back around and, and pay them off after the check arrived. And I know what that's like. And all of that had a personal guarantee on it. All of that, they would have come and affected my family if the business had any issues. So if they if someone wanted to start like from ground zero and build up their business credit so that they personally weren't involved, give me those steps. What does that look like? Where do you, where do you begin? I already covered the first. We want to get that fundability in line before you even think about applying for any kind of money. The second thing is, is well, to, to go back to your point, you have to realize that guarantees are required because your business can't stand on its own. It's just, it's logical if you think about it. I mean, you know, Michael Dell doesn't sign for, for Dell with $100 million credit lines because Dell is more valuable than the, than the founder at that point, right? So the, the debtors have more to gain by going after the company than the individual. If you just think of it from that standpoint, that's exactly what you're trying to create. So in order to do that, you've got to be, be able to build a credit profile. The deeper the credit profile, and by deeper, Corey, I just mean the more accounts you have on there that you've shown this history of paying is agreed, the higher amounts you're paying back, then the more you do that, the more types of credit financing eventually become available without the personal guarantee. So for example, credit cards are really easy to get, whether it be, as you mentioned, a Home Depot, a Staples credit card, an Amazon, a Walmart, or even a Visa card or MasterCard, auto financing, all that's really simple to get without guarantees and credit checks. You've got to build that fundability first. Then you've got to build that initial business credit profile and score. And that happens with about five accounts okay. on your business credit reports. Let, um, let me ask you a quick question sure. here, because I know in regards to personal credit, you know, if, if I go... All right. So I have this understanding, thanks to 
are um, thanks to Mr. Rondi Lambeth, who, uh, you know, I've followed so much of what he has to tell me on personal credit. And I've come to understand really well that um, and I think I understood this, you know, a long time ago, just uh, due to uh, applying for mortgages and kind of absorbing that information organically. If if, uh, you know, FICO is looking at the definition of who's the perfect consumer and then measuring you against that. So when, uh, you know, the perfect consumer is going to have like three major credit cards with three banks, they're not going to need to go get a Pier 1 credit card. They don't need to go get a Macy's credit card. They don't need to get a, uh, you know, a, a gas station credit card. They're just going to use their three major credit cards when they need them and they're going to pay them off. So when I hear things like go get a Home Depot credit card for your business, it seems counterintuitive because I know on my personal credit, if I go out and apply for a Home Depot credit card, it's just going to flatten my credit score for a while because the perfect consumer doesn't need a Home Depot credit card at a 25% interest rate. They don't, right? Uh, so doing that for the business almost seems counterintuitive, but you're saying that's a good idea. Home Depot, like what, Uline, you know, places like that, that fund business expenses, that's not going to hurt your business credit to apply for those things? No. So when we, and you bring up a great point, when we look at consumer credit, and by the way, Rondi is the man when it comes to consumer credit, him and I have been in this space for decades together. Uh, but that being said, you know, consumer credit, the FICO score is very complicated and it's convoluted. And you mentioned earlier, okay, well, it's, it's similar to, to personal business credibility, business credibility, way simpler. And here's why with consumer credit, you've got a consumer FICO score. We're all familiar with that. There's five components to the score. For example, 35% of it is payment history, 30% is utilization that we talked about 15%, the length of time you've had credit, pretty tough to control. 10%, the number of inquiries you have and taking into account how many of those become real accounts. And then as you mentioned, credit mix is 10% of it. You want to have three credit cards that are primary credit cards, one to two signature loans, one to two mortgages, one to two auto loans. So if you think about the consumer FICO score, it's very difficult to get really good score because if I improve one, I hurt the other, right? So if I want to increase utilization by adding more available credit and I get more credit cards, well, now I put new inquiries on there. Now I threw off my credit mix. And what I'm doing to act, improve one aspect of the score lowers another. And that's the way the FICO is. But if you look at the main scores in the business credit scoring world, let's look at the Paydex score, which a lot are familiar with. It's only based on one thing, how you pay your bills. It's kind of common sense lending. Like, do you pay your bills on time or early? Oh, you do? Okay, well, how early, how late? If I'm 30 days late on average, my score's 70 with Dun & Bradstreet. If I pay on time, it's 80. If I pay expected early with one to two weeks early, my score's 90. I could literally tell you to the digit what your business credit score is based on, on average of how you pay. So DMB says, if you're 32 days late, here's your score. So all you have to do to get good scores in the business world is get accounts that report to the reporting agencies. But it's also tricky because the reality is 90% plus of these trade vendors, these people that will give us credit, don't report to the business credit reporting agencies. And we're not used to that. We're used to going to Target and they ask us for a 20% discount. If we get their card, we get it. We know it's going to show in our consumer credit reports. It's not the case in the business world. Nine out of 10 plus of those accounts don't report. So in order to build the initial business credit, we've got to get credit with credit issuers that do. Now, if we have really good personal credit, well, there's a program called Credit Line Hybrid, all kinds of credit credit lines we can get to jumpstart the business credit profile, a lot of them which report to the business reporting agencies. But another way is using starter vendors, places like Uline or Granger or Marathon Gas Station, 76 Gas Station Supply Works from Home Depot. What's unique about these sources is they'll give you net 15, net 30, net 60 day terms. So they give you 15, 30, 60 days to pay them back. They'll give you credit when you have none and they report the credit to the business credit reporting agency. So when you get a credit with a handful of these accounts, Corey, they report to the business reporting agencies. That gives us a credit profile. If we pay on time or early, that gives us good scores. Now we have a foundation we can then move on to get credit with retailers, like you said, Home Depot, Amazon, without the personal guarantee and credit check, the auto financing, the Visa card, the MasterCard, the fuel cards with Philip, you know, with uh, Sunoco, Canoco, all this credit financing becomes available. And when we can get it, it just depends on how many accounts are on the business credit report. So it's really simple, Corey. It's just simple. We just got to get accounts that report, which is the hard part to find those. But when we do that and we follow the right tiers in the right order, then what happens is more and more and more tiers and types of credit financing become available without the guarantee, without the credit check, based on the business's ability to pay, not ours individually. Okay. So let me ask you, uh, let me ask you a question about uh, mentality here. A lot of entrepreneurs um, are, are probably listening right oh, now. Oh, wait, Corey, Corey, Mike, you didn't write that down. I'm trying to fill three pages. So I don't know what you're doing to stand. Well, I'm actually Sorry, uh, moving on to the third page, but I'm okay. trying to make sure it's absolute gold. I just want credit.
where credit's due. That's all I'm asking for here, Mike. <laughs> you know, I'm going to put done. something on the third page. <laughs> all right. So sorry, Corey. Here's, your third, here's your third page, Mike. You ready? Here it comes. <clears throat> Most entrepreneurs are hearing what you're saying right now. If they're joining us on Facebook Live, if they're consuming this uh, as a podcast or on YouTube, they're listening, they're taking notes, they're scribbling down like Mike is right now. But what I want to know is, okay, when it comes to mindset or understanding of business credit, tell me from your experience, what are the two biggest mistakes that every entrepreneur makes? What do they believe that is wrong about business credit? And how can we switch that? way of thinking? I think one of the biggest mistakes I see is that just because business owners think they have the money, they're more inclined to pay cash than pay their bills on credit. And this is this Dave Ramsey strategy philosophy that, that a lot of people are exposed to on the consumer world. The problem is in the business world that because 90% plus of vendors don't report to credit, we need to get credit with those that do. And then we need to use that credit. We want to show lenders and credit issuers that we're getting money and we're using the money to grow the business. I'll give you a simple example, Corey. We spend over a million dollars on Facebook, Google ads, right? We could easily take that money out of our bank account. We could easily just give them our debit card, give them our, our routing number and have them deduct that money. It's, it's easy. We've got the cash to do it. But we put it all on an American Express card. And then American Express card reports to the business credit reporting agencies. Why? Because every other lender and credit issuer that's looking into giving us money sees that we're spending over $100,000 a month with Amex. We're creating a history that they can look at. And it's that history that will determine their, them wanting to give us money in the future. So this is a mistake I see a lot of people make. And we even had one of our BA members came to me and said the same thing. Hey, they're calling my credit line due. They want me to give them the money back and they're shutting it down because my business credit's bad. Well, the business credit just wasn't established. So what happens is, and he said, I get credit with all these media buyers and all these people I'm paying money to. Yes, you do. But none of that is recorded. There's no history of that. So lenders and credit insurers can't see that you're spending all of this money. So you want to be able to get credit that reports and use that credit to fund the business. Even if you pay off the credit before interest accrues, you're creating this history for lenders and credit issuers to look at. And that history is what will raise the recommendation limits from the bureaus. And it's what will get you loans and credit lines and get you away from personal guarantees just by creating that history. So that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I see business owners make is, hey, I have the money, I can pay for it instead of using credit that actually reports and creating a history of their payments. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that I know I can personally relate to. You know, I, I once had one of my mentors tell me, he said, look, if you are not comfortable carrying debt all the time, you have no business being an entrepreneur because you need to be. You need to be okay carrying debt, rotating that debt, making sure that you're, you know, you're charging to it, you're paying it off. Like that's, that's part of the game, right? And uh, that's what you're saying is you need to be comfortable with that mentality and knowing that you're investing overall in the long-term value of your business and that business credit. Okay. One last question here, because, um, you know, we're getting toward the top of the hour and I do want to be able to open it up for Q&A from our internal viewership, uh, the board of advisors members that are watching right now. But uh, one final thing, Dun & Bradstreet, right? They, they want you to believe that they are the end all when it comes to business credit. And anytime they reach out to you, it's a salesperson on the other end of the phone who's trying to get you to buy into some sort of package and they use fear tactics. They're sitting there saying, if you don't buy this package, it's going to ruin your business credit or the creditors, you know, we just had somebody ping your business credit. We're calling you to let you know that your profile is incomplete and it's going to cost you hundreds of dollars to complete it. But if you don't do that, you're going to be a ghost and nobody's going to know who you are and you're never going to be able to build business credit, right? We're all familiar with hearing these pitches from Dun and Bradstreet. How important is that Dun and Bradstreet report? And do entrepreneurs need to take advantage of those expensive packages in or and spend time in order to uh, in order to complete a business profile and make sure that it's visible to the banks and the lenders? Dun & Bradstreet is important. Having a Paydex score, building your business credit with Dun & Bradstreet is very important. They're the most commonly uh, used business credit reporting agency, but you never need to pay them a dime. The Dun's number you get from them is 100% free. So maybe you go to creditsuite.com forward slash Dun's, D-U-N-S to get it, or they can just search, you know, free Dun's number with Dun & Bradstreet, spend 10 minutes filling it out, an application and get the Dun's number. The credit profile, which they'll also tell you you should pay them for, uh, will get activated when you have three accounts reporting. I already talked to you about credit line hybrid and starter vendors that you could use to 
be able to get those three accounts. You get three accounts reporting to DMV and get the Duns number, you get a credit profile score. Um, as you mentioned, if they call you, first of all, it's not really them calling you. Dun and Bradstreet, uh, basically a section of it got bought out. They were referred to as Dun and Bradstreet Credibility. DMB Credibility is the one that started selling this credit builder, selling the credit monitoring with these aggressive tactics. And since they split off and became their own, um, they have a class action lawsuit every single year of their existence since because of these high pressure and really inaccurate tactics they're using of saying you have to get with them when you don't have to get with them. So a lot of that's died down as they've lost more and more of these cases. But the bottom line is you need a panic score. You need a Dunstan. Number, you can get it for free. You never need to pay DMB a dime. And I and I promise you that if DMB calling you, they're trying to sell you something. So if you don't want to be sold, then don't pick up the phone. Don't call them because when you do so, you're talking to a sales rep that's going to try to sell you one of their products. Beautiful. I appreciate that. You know, it's sometimes it's just the foundational things. Many business owners understand this stuff, but there's a lot that don't. And uh, you're kind of filling in the cracks for a lot of people today who are seasoned and then giving a lot of great advice to people who may not be and are consuming us. Uh, you know, they're entrepreneurs, they're startups, they're consuming us on Facebook Live and they're looking for uh, ongoing advice. So listen, Ty, I know we couldn't possibly cover down on everything that's swimming around in your head today, but you've given us a lot to think about. I really appreciate Appreciate you being with us in just a moment. We're going to open it up for Q&A from the internal membership of Board of Advisors, our sponsor, who get the privilege of being able to attend live on the Zoom call today. But before I do that, for anybody else that's consuming this in some other format or they're not a part of the Board of Advisors membership and they don't have that privilege of getting to ask you uh, questions live, uh, please tell me, how can people uh, find out more about Credit Suite, your business, or find out more about you? Where do we send them? We've got a great step-by-step -step business credit building guide that also goes th through fundability. And a lot of stuff we just didn't get a chance to talk about, even including more vendors you can use to start building business credit. And then grab that at creditsuite.com forward slash EIN. That's creditsuite.com forward slash EIN. Wonderful. I appreciate it so much, Ty. Okay. So uh, listen, I want to open this up for internal Q&A. You know, a lot of what Ty's talking about right now is kind of foundational to being able, <laughs> Mike is holding up page after page after page. Right. Okay. I'll tell you what, we'll let, I'm going to be looking for people to unmute their mic. And as soon as you unmute your mic, I'll give you a chance. But first, Mike is waving around his notes. So I want to hear from Mr. Mike Calhoun, of course, the CEO of our sponsor, the world's greatest mastermind, Board of Advisors. Mike, I, I feel like you might need your own show just to go through your notes. Well, I do like to be the center of attention. No, kidding. Um, <laughs> Ty, listen, you know, we've we've done quite a bit together over the years. And then, you know, with an acknowledgement here to Rondi, just the education on the business credit side, the education on the personal credit side, it is, there is a strategy there. There's a little uh, sophistication that has to take place to kind of build both of them. They're, they're different. They're the same, but they're also different. And, and I got a bunch of, uh, I actually wrote, just so everybody knows, I wrote a little bit larger than normal so that we could... <laughs> actually uh, attain the three-page record just for Ty, because I know how competitive he is, but, uh, you know, I didn't want to let him down. So first off, cons the, these are bullets now. First off, consumer cards are not designed to fund a business, and it's the first mistake that most business owners make is they pull out their consumer card, they use it to fund a business, and they become paralyzed from actually achieving business credit because they used the wrong instrument first. So the first thing we need to do is make sure we do not use our consumer credit to fund a business. That's that's the first takeaway that I gathered. And uh, it, it really does. It paralyzes you from being able to make the right move, right? Uh, the truth behind the uh, business credit is it's designed to fund, not only to fund, but also operate a business on that, like you said, 15, 30, 60 day cycle, um, independent of the consumer so that the consumer is not harmed, the business actually has this as an instrument or an asset to run and fund that business. That's what it is designed for. It's actually a good thing. I think a lot of people, like you said, Dave Ramsey, you know, kind of puts this credit in a box of being uh, dangerous or potentially bad. It is a good thing. And it is leverage, and it is an instrument that we use to grow our business. Um, it's and it's actually what uh, it's exactly what big businesses are doing, right? 
if we're not making the same moves that other successful businesses are making, how are we going to grow the business? How are we going to achieve, you know, the certain scale that they're able to achieve? They're not running their business on their own cash and they're doing it for certain reasons and it has certain benefits. There's, there's a phrase that we all know, there's a cost of doing business. Even if you could do it with your own cash, why not establish the lines that increase the strength and the leverage and the opportunity to run a more secure, powerful business, right? Yeah, and Mike, uh, let me just chime in for a moment because to that point, if you're looking for an exit at some point, your business credit comes into your valuation. It's considered a very valuable thing that goes along with the business. Sure. If you're not just doing an asset sale, if you're looking to do a sale of shares and actually exit the entire business, sell the brand, like get out all together, that business credit is a big part of that valuation. So investing in that is investing in the value of your business overall. Absolutely. The um, the other bullet here is the sooner you get your fundability in line, the better. And I think that's really what your platform does, Ty. Getting the, the there's a there's the check boxes need to be filled in, and we've gone through that uh, platform in detail in you know uh, years past, where you know just right down to a website, the right type of phone number, the right type of branded emails, all the little check boxes that make you not look like you're operating out of your house as an independent provider, but a real company or, you know, it's a little bit of posturing, but you guys have that system. Um, more healthy trade lines, the better, right? Like, and I guess really what that correlates to is um, business credit is built to carry the load. And what I learned from Rondi is you're, so, you're, you're really better off having a lot of personal credit that you never use, right? Really, that, that's, that's what helps your positioning for getting more credit. Just get it, but don't use it. On the business side, they want to see you using it. They want to see you paying it off. They want to see that healthy load come on and then the load come off with you know, timely payments. It's built to be kind of exercised, right? And... Um, I, what did I have here? I had uh, kind of an equation, personal credit, the more credit, less utilization. Um, and then business credit is, is really truly built for utilization. And the more lines you have, the better. Um, I'll just finish with this third page. Don't be scared of it, right? Don't be scared to establish it. Don't be scared to use it. Make it part of the cash flow. And that's really what I've been able to do in a lot of the businesses in the past is I don't pay anything with operating money. It's all paid on the card. And then at the end of the month, the card gets paid off. And there's a security aspect in that too. I don't want to use cash for anything other than to pay off that card or that line of credit or whatever you know instrument I'm using. Because if something goes on that's not that doesn't belong there, then it's a lot easier for the credit card company to handle it than to go get my liquid cash back, right? So it's kind of a, a margin or a buffer zone. You know, the, the, the transactions come in, they're all on a card, we quality assure it, it's protected by, you know, that instrument. And then when it's quality assured, then at the end of the month, we've kind of bought 30 days and we pay that off. So um, it is once it's designed and part of kind of your cash flow and operating cycle, it becomes a great tool that uh, creates a little bit of security, a little bit of cash flow protection. And while doing that, it also creates a track record of history that will help get you more lines in the future. And, and that's one of the things that I think I've learned most from both uh, you, Ty, and, and Rondi is you get credit when you don't need it right? Establish that history, establish those lines. And every year, every year, I sit down uh, with Kingsley, the banking relationships that we've established for the different companies that we own. And I go back and ask, okay, well, I had a line for a hundred grand. Can I get 200 grand? Can I get 300 grand? Even if I'm not using it, they go. And that's part of the question there. It's funny. The bankers don't even realize why I'm asking for it. They're like, you don't use it. Why do you need more? Well, I would like to create a stronger relationship with you. Can we have more? Can we take that from 100 to 200 or, or whatever the numbers are, right? 
Um, I think it's uh, a proactive because you never know when you're going to need it. You don't know when you're going to have that opportunity to really, you know, uh, compete better against your competitors or buy a piece of real estate, move from a leasing office to an owned office or something like that. So um, I, I love the call today. I think there's a lot to be learned from just having a little more sophistication in the, the just the flow of payments, inventory management, how things kind of, you know, like work like we talked on the call. All right. So Mike, thank you for the recap. I mean, that's, you no, know, no, I have more, I have more. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, uh, I want to respect everybody's time. We're almost at it, um, 15 minutes past the hour right now. I appreciate everybody who has attended this week. I appreciate you being with us for Go CEO. Remember, we do do Go CEO live. We stream it live every single Friday at noon Eastern. And we get to hear from our sponsor, um, board of advisors, our, the CEO, Mr. Mike Calhoun. He's with us every single Friday. And we, uh, we talk to different interviewees every single week covering down on a lot of different industries. We bring on really powerful influencers, people with an enormous amount of value to bring. So we appreciate you being with us for Go CEO this week, and uh, we will see you next Friday. Cheers.